There's three main sticking points that guys come to us with. And the first is approach anxiety, that feeling of being not good enough, going in with that negative mindset. She's going to say no, she's busy, I'm not going to be her type, you know, a million excuses. So they're starting off already on the wrong foot and that affects their energy, their vibe, their body language, everything. The second one is uh, conversation skills, just being able to express yourself with confidence and authentically. The third one is getting stuck in the comfort zone we call it, which is just not escalating in any way at all, not showing his intent, not flirting. The most common one out of those three and where it all kind of lies is that conversation skill. Essentially that transition from opening line to getting her full attention, emotionally and mentally. I mean, that's that transition, it's very, very difficult to achieve. I'm joined by Kezia Noble. Kezia, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. What do you do for a job? Describe your job for me. I'm a dating and attraction expert for men. Dating and attraction expert for men, so not for women. No. Why? That would, that would be the blind leading the blind. All right, okay, okay. I get, I, I get that. I, I've noticed this online upon doing a little bit of research for this. It appears there's a lot of women teaching men to date. Why is that the case? Why is it that women are teaching men to date and not men teaching men to date? Um, okay, so my research says the complete opposite, is that there's more men teaching guys uh, to, to attract and date. Um, I do think that there are some women who are now, you know, doing their thing. I think that's quite recent. Um, but I actually know a lot more guys that do this than women. Um, I think maybe... Um, I think the guys get a lot of um, bad press, unfortunately. Uh, the media seems to want to crucify pickup artists, pick up anything related to pickup. And if you're a woman, you, you, um, they're more how can I put sympathetic um, to you teaching this, which is which is totally unfair. I mean, it's good for me, but, you know, <laughs> but I'll say it is unfair because a lot of these guys, I think, um, are providing a service. Isn't it interesting that the end result is the same thing? The end result is getting men to be better daters, more effective at being attractive, but because a girl's delivering it, it's somehow less seedy, less what? Yeah, less seedy. Um, it's like an easy target, isn't it? It's like, okay, if a guy's teaching another guy, the, the, you know, the media, the general public believe, you know, oh, he's untrustworthy, that word like seduction, it's, it sounds very, um, very contrived. Um, he must be using tricks and um, he must be um, lying to her on some level. Whereas if a woman is, is teaching it and she's not actually going out and applying and demonstrating it, that's okay because it's in the abstract almost. Um, it's, it's more kind of like, well, it's theory rather than she's going out and doing it. It's interesting um, that I, I find it fascinating that there's a branding problem for men teaching men to pick up women and you've managed to get this competitive advantage. So fair play to you. Fair play to you. Well done for being born that gender. And Yeah, it's great, huh? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So first things first, where do you see men going wrong the most when dating and trying to attract women? Um, well, let's, let's look at the most common um, sticking points that guys come to us with and, and what I see in general when, when guys are approaching me or my friends um, the, There's three main sticking points that guys come to us with and the first is approach anxiety um, That feeling of being not good enough um, Going in with that negative mindset. She's gonna say no. She's busy. I'm not gonna be her type She probably likes black guys. She probably likes white guys, you know a million excuses. So they're starting off already on the wrong foot and that affects their energy, their vibe, their body language, everything. That's the first one. The second one is uh, conversation skills, just being able to express themselves with confidence and authentically. Um, guys will often talk to a woman with a nice guy filter on, I call it. It's a filter. Um, so they, they're sort of playing not to lose rather than playing to win. They um, will just go in there and be very safe, the conversation will be very safe, they'll say the same kind of generic stuff that everyone else says, um, and then at the end of it they kind of feel like, well that wasn't me, It was that was a poor representation of who I am, in fact that wasn't me at all, that was a very watered down version of me, 
And that's like if we put a filter on anything, it gives a kind of nice effect, but it's not impactful. And um, as I said, it's, it's, it's an authentic. So I think a, a massive part of it is just guys running out of things to say, not saying anything impactful, not making a connection. And the girl loses interest very, very quickly. She makes a decision. It's kind of like when he does actually say something quite interesting, mentally she's already sort of checked out. And it's very difficult to, um, you know, make impact later on. Um, the third one is getting stuck in the comfort zone, we call it, which is just not escalating in any way at all, not showing his intent, not flirting. This kind of comes to the, the, the second point, which is a nice guy filter, which waters down your character, your boldness, your charm, just waters everything down. And it goes back to the, the idea of playing not to lose, you know, not taking any risk at all. Um, and then having a very platonic conversation with the girl. So the girl's kind of thinking, well, you know, does he like me? Does he not? And if he does like me, he's not showing much intent. Um, so I don't really know where this is going. So I'd, I'd say that most of the sticking points that we have will fall under one of those three categories. But uh, the most common one out of those three, and where it all kind of lies, is that conversation skills, that essentially that transition from opening line to getting her full attention emotionally and mentally I mean that's that transition it's very very difficult to to achieve that's so interesting I can see both in my own experiences and in the ones of my friends you might not know I'm a nightclub promoter so I've watched about a million drunk people go in and out of venues obviously one of the main reasons that people go out is that they're perhaps single perhaps looking for a partner just you know whether that be serious or casual um, and up to the girls that are listening, right? You might be thinking, oh, what am I going to listen to loads of dating tips for guys for? But I want to hear throughout this conversation as Kezi is bringing up these sorts of things. I want to hear if you've noticed this. So just leave it in the comments below or give me a DM, um, about whether or not you're noticing this, whether or not you have these guys that come up to you and just have this real vanilla personality, like whether or not you think that all guys or the vast majority of guys have nothing to say. Whereas it might actually just be the case that they are selecting for a particular type of guy who is nervous around you because you're a pretty girl and you've got pretty friends with you and you're dolled up and you've got your hair done. And uh, blokes, really, we we go out as a group, but like you don't. before we were going out, we probably had our jeans on backwards. You know, we probably didn't really think too much about what we were going to wear. And then you're the, you know, fully done up. So yeah, I'd love to hear what girls' experiences of being on the receiving end of the sorts of things that we're going to go through today I like. Um, so first things first, how do guys get over approach anxiety? If you don't go and speak to the girl, you don't even get the opportunity to say something that's totally shit to her. Mm. So it's a two-pronged assault that we use um, on this approach anxiety. Uh, the first is actually getting numb to the sensation of fear. I'm a big believer in numbing out rejection. Uh, overcoming it, I think, overcoming a fear of rejection it's a difficult one. I did a video about this, in fact, and I waffled on in it so much because it's very, very complex how to really overcome rejection. I don't believe that you truly can overcome, not so much the fear, but um, uh, I don't want to waffle on here, so I'm just reining in a little bit. Um, it's becoming numb to that feeling of fear. So the more you do something, you get rejected a few times, hurts, and then basically you numb to it. You become desensitized to it. And that's when I say the kind of fog lifts a little bit and you start taking better risks and you start becoming um, a lot more, how can I put it, um, level-headed about the whole approach. So if you are going into an interaction and you're like, um, you know, fuck it, I'm just going to do it, I'm not going to think about it, and then she rejects you, that can still hurt you, but after a while, it numbs and you have clarity. That's what I'm looking for. You have like clarity. Okay, so I don't feel the pain anymore. What do I need to do next? You start asking the right questions. If you're coming from a place of like anger, like, well, fuck her. She, you know, <laughs> am I allowed to swear on your so, Swear away. Fire okay, away as much I as you want. I should have asked that before. Apologies. Totally fine. So, um... If you're going in that attitude, which is, oh, I hope she likes me, I don't want to be hurt, okay, that's a fog in your head. 
if you're going in with a kind of like, fuck you, I don't care if you like me or not, you're going in with anger, that's a fog, you can't get clarity, you can't work out what to do next. When you are numb to something, you start asking the right questions, okay, what do I need to do to improve? What, maybe it's that, maybe I need to adjust this slightly. Can't do that when you're, you're caught up in that fog of anxiety and you know fear and hate and um, um, feeling inadequate, it's just it's fog. So we, we do that, get them to go up, talk to girls, actually get over the physical um, reaction of the anxiety. But then we go sort of backwards. So a big fear that guys have when I speak to them is not even the rejection, it's, it's actually the fear of running out of something to say, that awkward moment. They're sort of not even at that point of thinking about rejection right now. They're sometimes thinking, but I've got nothing to say to her. Uh, but what if she says this and I don't know how to respond? If you know, if you become a master conversationalist and you know, look, it doesn't matter what she throws at me, doesn't matter what, she can tell me to fuck off and I'll make it work. She can tell me that she's from a country I've never heard of and I will, I will um, say something that will absolutely, you know, capture her imagination and it will want, make her want to invest in me. I can trigger her curiosity with whatever she gives me. If you have that kind of level of skill, the approach anxiety decreases because you're, you already know, look, no matter what, I'm going to have an interesting conversation with this person. So what, that's what we do, like this is my seven day mastery program, we used to just kind of start off with helping them overcome approach anxiety, as I said, just going out there, getting numb to it. And then I realized, no, we should be doing conversation skills simultaneously, because they're going to get to this point where they overcome the approach anxiety, you're going to talk to a woman, and then they're going to be like, oh shit, I've got nothing to say, and then <laughs> guess what? That approach feeds anxiety. back into the approach anxiety. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. So... Honestly, the best thing that you can do is become a master conversationalist. Become brilliant. Just say whatever she throws at me. Have it all like lined up. She says this to me. She says that to me. I got it. I got this. I'm not. I'm going to capitalize on whatever she says, and I know how to do it. So a lot of students come to me. They go, I just want to freestyle and be, all, you know, authentic. I'm like, good luck. Good luck with that. Um, sometimes you do need those kind of go-to lines and that go-to sequence almost at the early stages just to get you through that horrible sort of transition point where everything's very awkward. Mm. So canned openers are a, a, a big sort of artifact of the old pickup artistry world, right? Like that was one of the things I think to have like the first you got to go in, then neg the beater, then do this. And it just harks massively back to um, the magic days of... of History. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like it just, it harks back to that. And I think that's, again, like as I'm hearing this kind of, whatever it is, third wave uh, relationship dating advice for men now or whatever it is, as I'm hearing this come out, I'm starting to see the development of that, right? So it used to be having these canned openers and getting over approach anxiety, avoiding getting KB'd and knocked back and all this sort of stuff. Um, but you've identified here that in order to kind of get your foot in the door, you need to have something that assists you in overcoming that approach anxiety. A safety net, I call it. I love that. So perfect example. This will be episode 200 and something of this podcast, right? I've done... 300, 400 hours of this podcast, I still get nervous before every single one because I don't want to say a stupid thing. At the very, very start, I speak to some professor from Princeton that I'm never going to speak to again unless we become best friends, which happens a lot. But I'll speak to some guy, but I still don't want to look like a, a fool to him and inevitably the people that are listening, which could be the girl's friends that are sat around her so the I way got, that i have got a tip for you. oh so you've got a tip for yourself go on i so want to hear this i just i prep the first question the only question which is fully scripted on this show is the first question because i just want to get i'm like right okay if i nail that first very first question I, i'm over it we're into the conversation and then it's just a game of spontaneity what i find interesting is that you've said relying too much on spontaneous wit is actually potentially going to be a little bit of a downfall when you're dating. Can I, can I just, yes, you're right, but there's just one caveat to that. There are people who are naturally witty. They're fine. They're good to go. 
I'm talking about people who find conversation very awkward, and most people do. Most people just are, are not, they're interesting people, they've got character, they've got a lot going for them, but they're just not engaging when it comes to conversation. They don't know how, they've just hung around the same people all the time. They haven't developed those skills, okay? Um, it's like a beautiful woman. Most beautiful women that I personally know don't have much banter because they've had to rely on their beauty. So, you know, that, that's all they've had to do. Uh, the, 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 the girls that are not so attractive have had to rely on their sex appeal, their, their wit, their banter, which is why, by the way, when you go to a strip club, the girl that is cleaning up the most is the least attractive one. She's using her head. She's using her banter and wit. Um, that's a fact. Every single strip club you go to, you'll see that the least attractive or like one of the, the less attractive, physically attractive women are doing much better than the really stunning girl who just relying purely on her looks. I digress. Um, <laughs> uh, back to the point uh, that I was saying. Okay, so if you're a, a witty person, then it's fine, but most people are not, they're not used to, um, you know, being in those situations where they have like literally three or four minutes to really make impact um, and market their attributes, keep her interested, connect with her, all this stuff that they're trying to remember. So I have these kind of things like conversational clickbait, things like that, little things I throw in there. I never tell them to lie, by the way. I never, ever tell them to lie. Um, and so I give them conversational clickbait. And I said, look, if you use this, it will be a great way for you to express your um, attributes, your, your selling points, essentially. Um, but it will also really um, spark her curiosity and interest and, and, and get her to invest in you. I'm a good conversationist, but I still rely on go-to lines sometimes. If I think, look, I need to, you know, I need to seriously make a bit of impact with this person, I will have my go-to lines, even now. So I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I've really seen it help. That's all I've seen. It's helped people. And then when you get really good and you become confident, because it's like a positive feedback loop, you start getting better responses. You start going, oh, okay. I don't need that anymore. I can use my own thing. Good, good. Use your own thing. Please get rid of my stuff as soon as possible and use your own stuff. That's what I want you to do. But it's those early stages. It's a bit like uh, what kids, they have those bicycles and stabilizers behind. Eventually you get rid of them. But they do need those stabilizers to build up the confidence to get on a bike first, right? Yes. I wonder how many of the girls are having a visceral reaction uh, that makes them feel uncomfortable at the potential for the opening line that a guy gives them to be something which wasn't actually designed for them because oh i don't give opening lines sorry um let me very very let me just make that uh, really really clear what i'm talking about here is the transition from opening lines so if some guys go to me what should i say i say well say anything to her you know ask her what time it is or tell her where she got her tan from i don't know tell her she looks good but what you do with the data that she gives you that is what uh, I care about. Okay, so the magic is in scaling that from it just being, hi, I'm here, look at me, I'm a person, to this is now a conversation and a dialogue yes, between that, the two. Yes, that's the really important part. A lot of guys come to me, I just need that magic opening line. I'm like, I, I've got great opening lines, don't get me wrong, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make her go, oh, that's interesting, and you're going to gain her attention, but what do you do with the data that she exchanges? Because, you know, conversation is an exchange of data. And a lot of guys forget that. They just start going into interrogation mode. And the reason is because they're, trying, <laughs> because they're trying to find the answer that they want. That ain't going to happen. She's not into the same stuff as you, commonality. What football team do you support? And even so, let's say How you much support can you Arsenal bench? and yeah. she supports Arsenal. So you're gonna, there's going to be attraction? I've never heard of a girl say so I slept with him because he supports the football <laughs> team that my dad supports. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know that. I love, listen, I tell you something now. I love dogs. I love dogs. I'm a, you know, dog bird. I don't like cats, I like dogs. And I'm telling you, you know, not a single guy uh, has, who said, I love dogs too. I've slept with him based on that. It's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of guys think, oh, as long as I find that one thing. Hmm. I wonder, I'm just, all of these are just open <laughs> loops, Kezia. So all that we're doing is opening loops. And I want to know from the thousands of people that are listening, have you ever slept with someone because you both like the same animal? Because someone will have done. Someone will be, oh, my God, you're a parakeet person. I'm a parakeet person too. And then 
that's it. That's the beginning of a flourishing. Oh, maybe the some... beginning. No, no, no. It can be the beginning. Like, okay, that's something we have in common. Then what do we do with it next? And it yeah. goes on and it starts going into different conversations and, and it becomes a very sort of multi-dimensional kind of interaction, very dynamic interaction. Yes. But I don't think anyone's going to say, well, because, you know, we both like the same, you know, fillings in our sandwich. <laughs> You use the same washing detergent. That's it. That's that could be the basis for Take a great. Take me to bed. It, it could be, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whisk me away. Where's the Uber? Um, okay, so that's how someone can get over approach anxiety. And I guess it's interesting that that leads into both the second and third aspects, right? The run out of something to say, and then the what did you call it? Like up, upscaling or the advancing the conversation to like show oh, escalating. Escalating. That's it. Yes, upscaling. Fucking hell. Marketing, too much marketing. Um, no, it's all about marketing. No, 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 you don't get me wrong. All, what I teach is essentially marketing. So I say to them, you're the product, go sell yourself. Um, and they first of all say to me, oh, I don't know what my qualities are. Well, that's a bad start. How can you sell yourself if you don't know what your qualities are? Can't so we sell start a product by- without an offering, man. You've got to have the offering. Look, it's all about it's either traffic or it's conversions. That's all that I'm bothered about. That's what we've been saying for years, traffic and conversions. Um, okay, so we've got that. We've got past the first bit. We understand that um, we can get past our approach anxiety with some chosen exposure, right, with deliberate practice so that the fear of rejection. And again, like to the guys that are listening, you know the feeling. I don't know why it's so terrifying. I don't know if girls can appreciate this. They probably can, but it is, it's the same feeling as standing on the edge of a very, very big drop sometimes before you go up and speak to a girl like it's like a a mortal danger it feels like you're in you're potentially going to die like you're about to get ready for a fight why do you think that is i think that for guys rejection comments massively on who we are it's wired into us evolutionarily we don't want to be rejected either by a woman or by the tribe generally um one of men's biggest fears is rejection right you don't want to feel silly I know I'm asking you, I'm just getting inside your head, that's all, because um, it's a, it is a big one. We have a, a bomb, we had a, a student who was a bomb disposal expert. He could, he, could, he could do that job, but he couldn't approach women. That is so good. We have police, we have firemen. Shit, I couldn't do I'm, I wouldn't run to a fire, I see a fire, I run the other way. Bomb disposal expert. Yeah, he was. He's actually on. We've got a video of him saying that as well. That is intense. But I, you know, that's a perfect example. And again, like girls, you might think, "Oh, I go on a night out. I make all of this effort. I, I do this, that, and the other." And uh, guys don't ever come up and talk to me. It might just be that you keep going to places where guys are shit scared of you because that's probably the most <laughs> most likely reason that guys might not be coming up and talking to you. I think it's gotten worse though. I think it's gotten worse. Why? Um, well, there's a few reasons. There's a few reasons. Men, and I remember, you know, I've been, I've been, I was going to nightclubs at like 13, 14. And, you know, I would, I was 40, I was a bit too young being in those nightclubs. <laughs> but I would watch, I would watch. And I saw men approaching a lot. This is in the 90s, okay. And I would see men approaching women a lot. I see women getting hit on all the time, in fact. And then, you know, as I got older, it started happening to me and my friends. Um, But the more I went to clubs, the more I found that, I don't want to say men are becoming pussies. That would be, that would be, um, no, I would would never say that. But uh, hmm, it's to do with, a massive part of it is to do with apps, bloody dating apps. I think that's a big problem with it. People are getting very used to using dating apps. I don't think men are pussies, but I think society has tried to pussify men. Um, well, I mean, a perfect example of this is the fact that it's challenging for a man to teach another man to date without it somehow being labelled as being seedy. Like, there has to Yeah, I mean, the media is totally... Society, media, you know, there's a mad witch hunt going on been going on since even before me too it's been a kind of thing like it's a strange thing i think i i personally i don't want to get too crazy with this tin you know tin hat foil tin foil hat tin tin foil hat on you 
But I think the media is made up, social media, a lot of these people in the tech, I think a lot of them are men who are no good with women. They're like uber geeks, uber, uber geeks we're talking about. Always been shit with women. Don't want to see other guys doing well with women. I think there's a, personally, I think there's like this big conspiracy theory, which is trying to make men into kind of very um, not effeminate, but uh, like pussify them. You know, you're wrong for wanting women. You're wrong for objectifying women. But yeah. Hello, I don't mind being objectified. I have no problem with it. I think the dynamic between the sexes definitely appears to be very different. You know, as someone who's 32, so I've been able to see the uh, clubbing from 2005 until 2020. So I got a pretty pretty good sample. Okay, to yeah, on. you do. But I've got even more ahead of you. I mean, I started clubbing in the 90s, and yeah. I'm telling you, it, even to be honest, in 2005, men were approaching women still. But you see now, they're looking at phones, they're looking at the apps. Um, it's, it's kind of like an easy way to meet women. Everyone says it's a shortcut. It's not actually a shortcut because I don't use dating apps. I'm single right now. I'm divorced and I'm a single mom. So I should be on those dating apps more than anyone. I refuse to go on those dating apps. You know why? Because I see all my friends going, oh, I'm wasting so much time on these dating apps. I was like, hold on, this is meant to be a shortcut. They're like, no, I'm going on date after date. I'm like, oh, I've never had that problem because every guy that I've gone on a date with, I've already met because he – he came and approached me or however, how introduced to me. So I, I met him already and I got a sense. And that's very important, the sense of who someone is. It's a feel, it's the body language, is it a bit off? What's their eye contact like? What's their manner? You, you know you sense people. And then when you go on the date with them, it can be a letdown, of course. We've had all her bad date experiences. But on the whole, it's, you, you, you don't, it's not such a big leap as meeting someone that you've only seen a photograph of. So actually, these people who are saying it's a shortcut, I'm hearing more and more that they're wasting time on dates and drinks on people that as soon as they meet them, they go, this is not the person that was in that photograph. I don't mean physically. I'm not talking, physically is another thing. No one looks like their photographs anymore. Not me, not you, not anyone. We're all filtered and, and people just go up like that when they see us. <laughs> but um, I'm talking about the sense of confidence because people are very, very, you know, Gun ho witty with those text messages, you know. They're very funny, very confident. And then you meet them and think, really? Is that the same person? Because it's easy to write, easy to write something and re edit and think about it. And, and when you actually meet someone one on one for a day, completely different. And I think that's a big part of it. I do think it's that's a big part. I think there's a media kind of, um, uh, is it uh, not motive? What's the word? A media um, something from agenda, agenda um, against men. Uh, women are also, I think, making it difficult for men. How? Um, well, I have a lot of students, and uh, this is more happening. I found in places like San Francisco, where there's a big kind of woke movement going on, um, and a lot of sort of um, feminists. And they're telling me, like, well, this is what they're telling me. I mean, I'm just giving you secondhand information here. That, um, you know, you just open up a door for a woman and they're getting shouted at. Shouted at for opening a door for a woman. So I can do that myself. And I, think, I think that's very toxic to do that, to have those kind of reactions to people who could just be being polite, not even interested in you. And I think that's kind of spreading a little bit. Most women are okay. Most women, if you go speak to them, they'll, they'll be fine, you know. But um, there is something, I think, that's been, um, been, 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 been changing for quite a while now. I wonder I mean, if the, why, do you, why do you think? I'm very curious to know. Why do you think men are approaching women less than in the 1970s or 80s? can't speak for, for that long ago, but I think apps and the... Uh, proliferation of people spending time online. Generally, more of our social time is now That's spent. A big one. It's just, just generally, you know, like uh, uh, people, guys talking to guys, girls talking to girls. It happens less because more of our communication is done through our phones, which inevitably is going to skew people toward being better online and worse offline. So that's that's part of it. That's um, the big one. I agree. That's that's yeah. the big one because it's just a skill. At the end of the day, having a conversation with someone is just a skill. But if you don't converse all that much 
you know, you, you can have people who I've gone weeks. I'm sure that, that you might have done as well. If you've just been head down in the funnel hole or in your marketing hole, doing your bits and pieces, if you're not careful, you can actually go long periods of days without saying a word to anyone, except for like, thank you to the checkout server at Asda around the corner. Yeah, you get rusty, don't you? You get yes. socially very rusty. But what do you think about the whole um, media movement? You know, that that kind of making guys into the enemy, that whole Me Too thing. I don't want to get too much into no, that. but fine. I, I, so I've thought a lot about this over the last year, the last couple of years. I think that it's challenging to hold in reality at the same time that the Me Too movement has been born out of a very toxic system that was obviously happening happening in Hollywood and women who quite rightly need to be heard and at the same time that typical masculine traits and the fact that men are the protagonists in the dating market for a reason because that is every men every male species on the planet bar like a penguin and a, a a fucking parakeet or something men are the protagonists sexually that is what happens men go up to women and as girls and the Me Too movement perhaps sometimes push that domain of what is fair um, outside of, you know, someone tries to open the door for somebody and whatever it is now, seventh wave feminism, whatever we're up to, um, perhaps pushes pushes this rhetoric a little bit too hard. Men, quite rightly, only have one response, which is to go, right, well, fuck it. Like, if that's the way that you want to be, I'm just going to leave leave it. I had Douglas Murray on the show, and he was talking about a friend. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Phenomenal guy. You'd love the episode. Had him on the show and he was talking about his friend's son. And his friend's son is like 18 or something, 17, 18. So you'd be thinking like just about to hit the straps with women, like really, really like hitting the ground running. And he asked his friend and he said, uh, so is he, is your son dating? And he was like, oh no, he wants nothing to do with women. And he's like, because Doug, uh, Douglas is gay, so he can yeah. say this. And he's like, oh my God, he's he's not fucking gay, is he? He's not gay. He's not got that. He's not got that as his future, has he? And um, he was like, no, no, no. He just thinks that they're far more trouble than they're worth. Doesn't want anything to do with them. Just thinks that they're far more trouble than they're worth and leaves them be. And like that is for everyone, for both sides of the aisle. That's a terrible situation for us to be. It's really shit. It's really, really shit. Um, For me, what really did it was that Gillette advert. I mean, that was atrocious, that Gillette advert. You remember the one? I had Sargon of Akkadon here talking precisely. Oh, well, I won't, I won't be an echo, but it was just the, the one scene that got me. Lo, all the whole experience got me, and I'm a, I, I have a son, so um, I'm telling you now. Boys like to fight. It's not society. Boys choose to fight. Okay, even if you have the most peace-loving hippie family, boys fight. Okay, that's it. That's what they're like. Is it wrong or right? I don't know, but it's a natural instinct in boys. Girls don't do it so much. Anyway, it was a bit when. A woman was walking by and the man went up to approach her and the other guy stood in front of him like, no, don't approach her. But you don't know what that guy is going to say. He could have, they could have got married as a result. Who is that man to come along and say, no, you can't approach her? I bet you that man, and I know, I know it's, it's just an advert and I'm looking into this, but I bet you if that was in your life, that man's married, he's got his life sorted out. The other guy's single, tough shit, tough shit. Um, and that really got me really, really angry. I feel like we're almost living in a Wahhabist kind of society. It's like men and women can't talk to each other. Get the fuck out of here and go to Saudi Arabia. Really, go live there where women are on one side of the, you know, of the wall and the men are on the other. And go, you know, you do you. It's a very okay, narrow. But- it's a very narrow worldview that believes that the the. the- most important situations that we have going on in gender inequality right now are occurring in the UK and in the USA. Like you just need to look to the Middle East and and countries which have a lot of work to do to realize that that's not the case. And I appreciate that the world, the sphere that everybody lives in is relative, not absolute, right? Like it's just your problem compared with the people in your immediate vicinity. So quite rightly so, like everything is done in relative terms. But yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that there's a lot of challenges at the moment just in the dating market generally. And I want to get on to actually what girls can do to kind of help men in a second. But just finishing off those last two stages of what we were talking about. So men have overcome approach anxiety. What can they do moving on to make sure that they have good conversation, any stuff for body language and eye contact? And then how can they escalate not upscale how can they escalate okay so 
it's called sexual escalation. Um, and this is, a lot of guys, what they think is they go, right, I need to approach the girl, build up comfort, rapport, get her interested, and then I need to sexual escalate. Yes, but you should be sexual escalating from the very beginning. Now that doesn't mean trying to physically turn her on at the very beginning. That's where men and women are, are quite different. Men are, it's much more physical. So I can be talking to a guy and it's quite platonic and not every guy, I'm not saying that, but you know, if it, you know, just like an kind of average guy, if I suddenly say, oh, let's go back to my house and everything's very platonic, all I gotta do is like switch down the light, put on a bit of music, give him a massage and I can turn him on. Okay, the, the average guy, because it's a physical thing. It's like, oh, okay, I'm stimulated. Now, women are not like that. Women don't say, turn the light down, change the mood, give her, give her a massage, and she's going to get horny. No. It's much more psychological. So I say to men, look, you can't just suddenly go, right, now I'm going to flip the switch. I'm going to start the, I'm going to escalate now and just get her, you know, aroused. Women can do that to men much more easily than men can do that to women. What the man has to be doing when I say escalating is he has to be um, sort of lacing the whole interaction with little attraction triggers. Okay, it's a more slow process. So he's got to, for instance, demonstrate high value. Okay, is this a man who has high value? Is this a man um, who has other options? Is this a man who's needy? Is this a man that can get women if he wants? She's trying to assess all these things on some level. Whereas a man isn't it with a woman. He's not. He's thinking, oh, is she up for it? You know? <laughs> He's talking the whole time, is she up for it? Is she up for it? Um, <laughs> she's got a boyfriend. It's, it's much more sort of black and white. But with a girl, she's trying to ascertain a lot of things. Is he a weirdo? Do other women find him attractive? Um, is he confident in bed? Is he, you know, it's all these things. And you've got to sort of drip feed sort of clues to this throughout and then you'll find that the transition to actually escalating and and getting her aroused is a lot easier what that makes sense what i said absolutely yeah what are some of the ways that you can drip feed that is it touching her on the knee when you say no, something is physical. it that's the physical i'm talking about what to say to her mm -hmm. kind of thing so Maybe if you, okay, so a physical one would be to stop, you know, halfway and then sort of take a look at her and say something like, you know, now I know I'm attracted to you. Now I know what it is. But anyway, you, you could do something like that. So it's, it's kind of very playful in those early stages. It's playful, flirty. Is he really flirting with me? I'm not sure. Creates a bit of a chase, you know, a bit of intrigue. Um, giving her a compliment and then backing off like nothing's happened. That's push-pull. You can do things like that. But it, what I'm trying to say here, there's lots of different things you can do. Yes, the touching thing, as you, as you mentioned, but uh, I personally am someone that doesn't really like to be touched that much. I'm just not a warm person. But a guy can really arouse me with his words, okay, and his attitude. Um, so it, it does depend on the woman slightly, okay. Um, but, yes, yeah, flirting, um, compliments, the way that you compliment, um, you know, just show her that you have other options. Women really need to know that. Women don't want to be with a guy or sleep with a guy that kind of no other girl maybe wants or that maybe. The other thing is if the guy's showing too much desperation or neediness, it's the other thing that can get in the way when it comes to sexual escalation, um, placing too much value, giving her way too much value, saying something like, oh, I bet you get this all the time. You know, something like that, it's just, that's a kill. Demonstrating you know, that, low value. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, if a woman does have a man, a man can always overlook it. I've noticed that. Women can get away with so much more because the man is kind of like, as you say, he's more programmed, like, right, he's shot for it. <laughs> he's, also, he's also not playing that status value game, right? He's not playing the game that, like, if you're attracted to a girl, it doesn't really matter if there's other guys that are also attracted to oh, her. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah he just wants to get his leg over, I know. <laughs> Very crude to say hey, that. We can be as crass as you want on this program. No, but he just wants to, like, you know, he wants to, um, he wants to fuck her, and it's like, oh, other guys interested in her? Who gives a shit? I want to fuck her. Um, you know, it, it, does she have status? I don't care. I want to fuck her. You know, but because she's she's nice looking, she's quite hot, and she's got a nice little personality on her. The it's it, the um, 
you know, what they're expecting. And I don't mean, this doesn't, I'm not trying to belittle men or anyway, but I, I think most guys, people going to be honest here, will agree, yes, that is the case. Um, whereas women, it's much more, they need, they need proof and validation or certainty that the guy's like this, that he's like that. And then they're trying to ascertain a lot more. That's what I'm trying to say, women. I know that's with me. I can meet a good looking guy. And if he's, if he's just good looking, I won't just sleep with a guy because he's good looking. I won't. Whereas a man will, a lot of men, not all, fine, but a lot of men will just sleep with a woman because she's hot. That's the only thing that they're interested in. I think that's, I think that's not true. Not even that. She's available sometimes. That's a, so that, that's a truth a truth that everybody's forgotten and it's an asymmetry in the way that we work as well and again this highlights i think as we move toward a world where some people are trying to make it much more egalitarian like almost completely homogenous between the genders you're going to end up with challenges because as you've identified there like what a man looks for in attraction with a woman is not the same as what a woman looks for in a man. And what you identified that I thought was really interesting was that you have men um, speaking to a woman in the way that they might find attractive as a man. So they're almost dating other men. They're like putting their own dating brain inside of the girl and saying, right, like, I'm going to attack me. I'm going to proposition me as her. It's like, no, mate, like you're playing chess. She's playing fucking exactly. someone else. And I've learned that with like how I seduce men. When I was young, I didn't have a clue what men want, you know, or anything. But now I know that uh, men like to chase. I know they like to chase. And they, I, I think most men don't want to be seduced. So what I do with guys is I will just, I'll, I'll, I'll say something that will get in their head. And it will, be, it will just be something, an image that will stay in their head. And then I pull back. And then that's how I do it. Because I know that they're operating on a different way to women. Um, that's a point. You said that a lot of people are trying to, you know, um, say men and women are the same. Let me give you an example. All my male friends, okay, who I love dearly, I have seen them at the end of the nightclub. These are good friends of mine. And it's at getting to the end of the club, and there's a right scrubber. I'm like, come on, really? And they're like, I just need to fuck for the sake of it. I'm like, really? She looks like Winnie the Pooh. Come on. And they're just like, she's up for it. And these are good looking guys. These are, these are guys that, you know, they, they, they fuck beautiful women, stunners, but they will fuck a Winnie the Pooh because it's there. A woman, you will never see her at the, at the end of the nightclub going, oh, just take anything. Him, him over there, that trunk guy, he'll do. You know, if he can get it up, I'm good. Women never don't, heard of women don't think like that. No, I but the that. man's like, there's a hole, there's a pulse. If he's in that mood, I'm doing it. I had Rob Rob Henderson, evolutionary psychologist, on the on the podcast talking about dating and evolution and how it all ties together. And he used this analogy, which I think is absolutely perfect. He said that men look for a reason why they wouldn't sleep with a woman. Women look for a reason why they would sleep with a man. And the stats, anyone that went back and listened to that episode, men swipe right eight out of 10 times and women swipe right two out of 10 times. That's the stats on Tinder. The top 80% of women are competing for the top 20% of men and the bottom 80% of men are competing for the bottom 20% of women. This is stats from <coughs> Tinder. Now you can dislike this as much as you want as a guy or a girl, but facts don't care about your feelings. These are the stats out of the back end of Tinder. What does that tell us? It tells us that hypergamy, women dating up and across, is challenging for both women and for men. There's okay. more women competing for a smaller pool of men. There's also okay. this problem with women becoming increasingly educated, increasingly rich, because women often don't want to date a guy who is better educated and or richer than them. And if you increase the level at which women are becoming educated, this isn't me saying like, ah, Chris, no, you're telling true. them that they shouldn't be educated. No, bollocks. That's not what, what I'm saying. saying. Obviously, what I'm saying is that because of the natural, um, the natural attraction dynamic where women tend to date up and across, they like higher social value. They like a man that can demonstrate that value if you have tons and tons of value, it's like being the really tall girl. Like if you're six foot as a girl without heels, you're looking at pro basketball players and stuff. Like you don't want to be able to not wear heels at your wedding. You don't want to not to be dating a guy that's shorter than you. That just happens to be. And if you take that rule 
and apply it to earnings and education, it's kind of the same. The higher that you move up the hierarchy as a female, the smaller and smaller and smaller your dating pool gets. Whereas as a guy, a guy will have a much broader dating pool. Okay, but there's one exception to the rule. And I'm in a really, really good position here. So I, you know, I'm going to say, yeah, I, I earn a lot of money and I'm successful and, you know, I've got the big car and everything and I know it's, yeah, some guy, you're absolutely right. Most guys want someone, a woman less successful than them. I, I agree. But apart from younger men, they, they get a massive kick out of it. And Toy boys. And I like younger men. Are you so dating good. toy boys, Kezia? Come on. Oh, barely legal. <laughs> Love it. I don't give a shit anymore. I used to apologize. Get, I, my friends used to take the piss out of me. It's like, I was like, I don't care anymore. I don't care. I do younger men. That's it. Fair and they love it. They love it. Fair you know, they love the, they love the car and being picked up in the car and, and um, you know, the, 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 you know From being college. successful. Huh? From college. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Please, come on. Let's be joking. Let's, let's be careful here. Let's be careful here, shall we? I'm joking. Let's I'm talk joking. about let's, eighteen and over. Eighteen and over is fine. Um, let's talk about the uh those artifacts that pick up artistry artifacts that uh, we spoke about earlier on. Anyone who hasn't read Neil Strauss's The Game or kind of the um, I guess the period from what about two thousand to two thousand ten where kind of pick-up artistry, or maybe a little bit later, maybe like 03 to kind of 13, yeah, yeah. where pick-up artistry and um, age. real social dynamics, RSD Max and all of these sorts of guys like were smashing YouTube and putting this sort of comment out. If you don't know who I'm talking about, just like go go back in time by a decade and, and you'll you'll see exactly what I mean. But being frank, like even I as a 21-year-old, 22-year-old hot-blooded male looked at that stuff and I felt icky like watching YouTube compilations of guys going up and practicing day game, which is just going up and like kissing girls in a fucking park somewhere whilst some other guy YouTube like videos it. I'm like, I, this, there's something kind of weird going on here. And with that having happened and perhaps set the foundation for what is now your industry, I can see why there is work to be done in the teaching men to become attractive and to date well game to perhaps undo some of the kind of unsavory stuff that happened a while ago. What's your thoughts there? Um, I agree you shouldn't ever film someone about their permission. I've never done that. I've had um, some of my trainers, they said, look, you know, can I put something on your YouTube channel when you approach a woman? I said, absolutely not. You do you, you do what you have to do, but, you know, that's not going up on my channel because I would hate something like that to happen to me. Um, but I do kind of get why they did it because people want to see evidence because these guys, you know, they came out of nowhere. People are like, well, can you actually do it? And if you just say, yeah, 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 I can, people are just going to be like, well, anyone can say that. I need to see some evidence. So I can see it from a marketing point of view why they, they want to do it. Um, you know, that, oh God, it's so funny. I have watched it really, really change uh, the pickup industry and it has gone much more into self help. But essentially, you're still teaching guys. How to attract women? You're just, you know, using different terminology now. Um, the people that were, the people that were teaching it then, they were people who almost were self-taught and had gone from literally zero to doing okay. Um, but it's changed now. Most of the guys that come, you know, walk through our door are guys that are okay with women. There are some that have not, not a clue, quite a lot. But there's a lot who are just like. They're doing okay, but they just want to do better. And I actually asked them, have you read the game? They never heard of it. So we're getting this new generation coming through, people that just want to get better at stuff. And I think we're living now in a culture where people believe in self-improvement. They're much more open and honest about it. So I think that's how it's, it's changed a lot. There's no problem in the press with someone saying, I read James Clear's Atomic Habits, though. But there is a problem with someone saying, I take dating advice or I, I'm, I'm taking a course to help to pick up women. I still think there's a fair bit of stigma attached to that. Why is, it's, why... it's changing. It is changing a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's still there. But for women to learn how to date men is perfectly acceptable. Have you seen all these people popping up? 
teaching women how to date men. And I'm like, well, why is that acceptable? You know, why is that acceptable when this isn't? I, I don't, don't get it. So I, I thought about that question a lot. I don't really know. I think I, I want to know. Like, women you, are not trying to get them to bed. Women are trying to do something much, much more um, sophisticated. It's trying to get a relationship. Well, I'm sorry, that's much more manipulative than getting someone into bed. Get someone to want to be in a relationship with you by any means necessary. Like, I will do anything to get that man to put a wedding ring on my finger. I think, my God, that's like some hardcore manipulation there that you have to do. You'd be like a completely different person. Getting someone into bed, I think it's. I don't. I just don't think it's so manipulative, personally. So you're saying that the impact of a short-term interaction by a guy being more effective is less than the impact of a long-term interaction where a woman oh. might might take these tips and then use them to have a, a five-year marriage with someone. How many times have I heard my male friends say, as soon as I married her, she changed. She lost. She put on weight. That's number one thing. Got really fat. Found out she had a drinking problem. You know, I've heard it all. I, I think men are the same. You know, a lot of women marry men. They go, something's changed. But I think with, I've heard a lot of women have um, completely changed. They've got it. You know, they have got, they've got the prize. That's the ultimate prize for women is that they've married. I've done the whole marriage thing. I don't want to do it again. But most women, they they done, you know, they get the marriage like, like I'm good now. I'm good. I've got someone to look after me, take care of me, have children, have a nice life. You'll love me no matter what. You won't divorce me now. And men really would do anything to avoid a divorce. I've got this whole theory. I don't know why men even marry anymore. I mean, that's crazy. How much should men think about their physical appearance? So we've talked Who? a lot. Men. How much should men think about their physical appearance? Like their own physical appearance. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Um, it is important. Um, but you can't become obsessed with it okay you've got to do the best you can with yourself um you know it's all about a good impression it does make a difference okay however saying that i have um i'm very i'm a very looks orientated person compared to the average woman i'm you know i i like an you know i like a handsome guy and i forgive a lot um of um i'll forgive a lot if he, if he has a nice face and a nice body. But even I will be like, okay, there's, there's a limit with that. It's it so a... boring that that face can allow you to be. And it's equally, I've been with men who are really not attractive, not young, not my type, physically really quite gross, and I've been attracted to them. So I always say to guys, look, game will, um, game, good game, um, is much better than being a type, much better. It's much more powerful. Um, so, yes, make the best of yourself. But remember, even if you make the best of yourself, you're not going to be every girl's type. She's just going to say, well, at least he's made an effort. He looks half decent if you're not her type. Work on the game. It's, mu it's much more scalable, I suppose, as well. The fact that if you have... If you're able to make people laugh, I mean, fucking hell, like if you're able to make people laugh, it's a superpower. It doesn't matter whether you're in a business meeting, whether you're on a night out, whether you're trying to date a girl, whether you're trying to de-escalate a fight outside of a nightclub. Like if you can make people laugh, perfect example of this. I was on Love Island. I was on the first season of Love Island. And Were you? Yeah, I was first person when through the doors. The first season, when was the first season of Love Island? Five years ago. It's been going on that long, has it? It has yeah. indeed, yeah. Although I guess we haven't had a season this year, so... Yeah, uh, but yeah, and John Clark, who's now on Towie, Jonathan Clark was on my season, and he's like a big, bigger lad, like not huge, but like a bigger fan. And there was like everyone on there was like the classic sort of reality TV physique look. No. And um, John got the Playboy model, the Scouse Playboy model, Hannah. He got her because he's just got bottomless charisma. Like the guy oh, yeah. is, the guy is just con He's from Essex, got that like classic sort of wide boy mentality, and he just goes and got. He's got so many stories, really funny, center of attention, despite the fact that physically, you know, there was guys on there that were ex bodybuilders and uh, professional, ex professional athletes and all this sort of stuff. But again, with that, John was demonstrating his value through being able to make people laugh, through being personable and easy to relate to, and and funny, you know. I think, here's a question for you. When you're on Love Island, and I appreciate that the girls, uh, personally, I don't, I don't like the look, this Instagram kind of weird face that girls have, but, you know, maybe that's your thing. 
when you were there and you saw these beautiful girls, the one that you were most attracted to, was she the prettiest one or was she the one with more game? So my season, um, I make the joke that our season was kind of like a dress rehearsal for the rest of them. Um, but I wasn't attracted to any of the girls on my season, which was the challenge that I came up against. And I couldn't fake it. Like, I'm like... Uh, Even though they were pretty? I didn't find them attractive. Oh, okay, physically. Okay, fine. I didn't find them. I didn't find them physically attractive. I found some of them interesting, but I didn't find them f- physically attractive. And that was a huge challenge. Like, going on a dating show and not finding girls attractive is... But then the, the, the showrunners kept coming in and saying... Because the guys weren't being that forthcoming they had real challenges like a couple made it to the final of season one of love island as friends like you can't imagine that happening now and the reason i suggest that that happened was that there was a mismatch between what the producers were putting in for the girls and what the producers were putting in for the guys and that must work in both directions to a degree but they kept on coming in and they were saying uh so <clears throat> what sort of girls are you attracted to? Why are you not like, how come you're not so fussed about this, that and the other? And a lot of the guys said, well, I tend to sort of prefer quite petite girls, maybe girls who go to the gym and this, that and the other. I shit you not. Season one of Love Island had Amazon women. Like every girl in heels was as tall, if not taller than almost all of the guys that were in there. And it's like, uh, you know, it's not like the girls are they're great, but they're just not massively my type. And there's only so far that you can kind of push that. Maybe like Winnie the Poos. No, that, no, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. That, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm I kidding. know you are. I um, know you are. But yeah, I mean, it's a good example of what you're saying. I mean, my my ex my ex husband was very handsome, but my ex boyfriend before him was really ugly. He wasn't hideous. He wasn't Quasimodo, but he was quite an ugly guy. Got any woman? But any woman. Right. Uh, absolutely fearless, playing to win all the time, used jealousy plot lines on women, understood that jealousy is makes w- women more attracted to guys. Um, he he was a force of nature in himself, but he um, also was, um, he, was he funny? He was quite funny, not that funny, but he had so much banter, so much banter, and he was always escalating, and he always had one foot out the door which means I'm not dependent on you. I'm not needy. And women love that. Women really love that. They don't want a guy to need them. They want a guy to want them. How does jealousy turn women on? Because if a woman gets jealous, she's in... Okay, it's not that... Sorry. It's not so much that jealousy turns on women. It frustrates them. But once the woman is feeling jealous, it increases her attraction. It's like... A, it's, it's kind of like... Um, it's linked to the fact that she thinks she wants your attention and you're giving it to another girl. That's the whole point. If she doesn't care about you and you're giving attention, to another, don't give a shit. But, you know, if you can see, right, okay, this is working a little bit. She's, she's, you can't overkill it. You can't, it's, it's a fine balance also because there's some guys, they're the other way. They're just too much, you know, and it's like it's all stick and no carrot. There's got to be a little bit. She's just got to feel, in order to appreciate you, she's got to feel that um, she can't second guess you. This is really important. Any guys listening out there, never let a woman second guess you. What's that mean? Got to be like she'd think, okay, so um, I've texted him, so he'll text me in five minutes, like he always does. Um, you know, everything is just predictable. Everything he's going to do is predictable. Um, he's a safe bet. They don't want it. You can't go, like I said, don't go too far the other way and say become the bad boy or anything. But you know that old saying, like, treat them mean to keep them keen? It actually, it doesn't really mean be a bastard to them. It means just keep them second-guessing a little bit. Don't be too predictable. Um, Never, ever get needy. Always show that you have other options if she doesn't want you. But that's really all it means. Yeah. And those, those alterations make a big difference. I understand. I'd be, again, interested to hear any girls that are listening, if they've been with a guy dating a guy that they found to be attractive but then there was a some switch turned on where he went into needy predictable boring mode and if that ended the attraction for you um i wonder how many guys and girls are sufficiently reflective 
about what was and what wasn't successful about a dating experience. It's quite easy for us to just, oh, well, she wasn't that this or he wasn't that that. And, you know, just like kind of throw reasons around. Whereas if you actually were to look at what happened, I'm going to guess that a lot of people would come upon some of the realizations that you've identified. Yes, and I think people need to be honest. And when I talk to girls and or girls, when I talk one on one with girls, I always like yes, yes. Sometimes when it's on social media, it's like oh no, no, I only want a nice guy. So I'm like, you know, look at the stats. You know, loads of nice guys running around. And what is a nice guy? What they're saying is they want a good guy. Okay, that's not a nice guy. Having a good man in your life, I'm telling you, he's got an element to him. What's the difference between is, a good guy and a nice guy? Okay, so um, the good guy, I, I'm going to simplify it. Okay. The good guy shows elements of the bad guy. The bad guy shows elements of the good guy. And those are the men who are successful, okay? And then you've got the people who are too good and they end up nice category. And then you've got the, the bad guys who are too bad and they become one-dimensional. So it's doing a blend of both. So if you say, look, I'm one of those people, I like to treat women well, I like to hold open the door, get the bill for them. I like that. I respect women, that's who I am. Good, let's work with that, okay? But make sure that you're not so good that you're not sexually escalating, that you're being really safe with what you're saying, you're not voicing your opinions. Um, little tip for the guys who are really like, I really respect women, is to, you know, to counterbalance that with being a bit of a bad boy in bed. This is very interesting. It's that, it's that contrast that's very attractive. So I went on a date, and I'm going to be quite personal here, I had a boyfriend and he was, you know, the good guy, very polite, everything. And it was getting a bit kind of like, mm, I need a bit of spice here. And he leant, over, he leant over during our dinner. And I was kind of like in that mode of saying, you know what, this is not really working out. And he said, I can't wait to fuck you later really hard. And I was like, oh, right. Okay. That's what I was looking for. Okay. But if it had been a bad guy, like a kind of, you know, a bit of a bad guy feel, which I date also, I can do both. And he started saying that to me. I'd be like, oh, please. It's like more overkill. of the same. It's overkill. So with the bad guy, what is interesting is women will go for the bad guy because you'll show the, the, the sensitive side in bed or the vulnerable side. And it's that contrast. So flipping it around, um, when I speak to men, a lot of guys say, look, I, I like the alpha dominant woman. And I said, yes, but I bet you like her to be quite submissive in bed. And you like her to be like quite vulnerable when no one's looking. And they're like, yes because it's a contrast, if they're going to go for a very dominant alpha woman and she's dominant and alpha in bed, there's no other side and it becomes boring. I had to learn to do that because I'm quite like tough and direct and I noticed that the guys that really like me are the guys who've seen my vulnerable side. But when I hide that vulnerable side from, from guys, they're like, you know it's what? It's too one-dimensional. Let's call it a day, love. You know, <laughs> That's my tip for guys out there. You want to be the good guy, go for it. That's your thing, and I encourage that. I don't try and change people like that. But my God, you need to show a different element to keep her on her toes. I love that. So finishing up, what dating and attraction advice do you have for women? We've given a lot for men this evening. What are the, what are the things that women can do to either help men be better daters or to be better daters themselves? To help men become better daters. Oh, well, obviously, God. as we've said this evening, like as a, you know, a high-level thing that I've noticed is – if a guy comes over, if you're single and a guy comes over and you're with your group of girlfriends, don't keep your back turned to him when someone comes up because it's the same girls that I know because I've seen, I've had 2,000, yeah. 3,000 people work for me over the last 10 years and they've all been between the ages of 18 and 21. And during that time, you have more relationships than you do lectures. And the girls that complain about being single, about not being able to find a good guy, are the ones who, when they're on a night out with their girlfriends and a guy comes up and tries to talk to them, will give him this sort of weird sneering, like kind oh, of this, that, so that, you mean like this? It's that, yeah, that over, yeah, the know, that, that over the shoulder thing. And it's like, well, fucking hell, darling. Like, do you want, do you want to have, a, do you want to give a guy a chance or do you want to look cool in front That's of your it. fucking mates? Give him a chance. This is my advice for ladies out there. Throw him a really interesting question. Oh, great question. Something really good that gives him that open goal, that opportunity. And if he fucks up, he fucks up his loss. What like? Um, I'd say something like, um, oh, God. I'm generally very nice to guys that speak to me. I mean, I'm really quite a nice person. 
I guess as a um, dating as a dating coach, I've you're, never, you're never going to be a, a prick to guys that are trying to no. do the thing that I've you teach people to do. I've never been a prick to guys, but even when I was younger, I was never, I don't know, I was one of those people that just, you know, I could be ruthless. When the time was up, I'd be like, okay, done. But I was never like, someone came to me, I never went like that. I never, I just think it's a horrible thing to do to another human being. It's vile when people do that. Horrible. Why do that? Um, well, I would ask something like, um, I'd just say, listen, what's your favourite film? I really would. I would just say very corny and fucking dorky like that. Because if they're going to fucking say to me, Shawshank Redemption or that other bloody film that men love, uh, what's it called? One of Leonardo DiCaprio and it's just a terrible film that every man loves. What's that? Inception, Inception or something? Yeah. Oh, I'm done. I'll just say, look, I'm sorry, I'm done. I gave you a chance. I gave you. I gave you. I gave you the chance. Okay. Could have just said something different. Ah, you could say something like, you know, what what do you do and why do you love it? Given the opportunity, see, you can really give them a chance, right? What are they going to say? They say something funny, witty, or are they just going to say, "I'm going to carry on playing it really nice and safe," and then you can think, okay, this, I, I, you don't be horrible to them. You go, that's nice for you. I have to go now, or something. Mm. But at least, you know, the guys like had that chance at least. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I, I think one thing that I hope girls take away from this, I know we've given a lot of advice. I promise you I'm trying to find a guy or a girl that can come on and can do the same thing for girls. I think there's an awful lot that both genders have to learn from hearing dating advice for the other side. I know that girls have just had to sit through an hour of like learning like, oh, this is how guys can pick up other girls. But <clears throat> there's a lot of insights that you can glean from that as well, right? To reflect on yourself. Oh, maybe, maybe that's the way that I am. Maybe it's this. The main thing that I'd love girls to take away from this. Well, I can tell you something. Hit me. For girls, men are very vulnerable. Don't believe all that kind of. They come to me, they're very vulnerable, and most of them really are looking for love. And that's not me being corny and trying to finish on a high note. Yeah, men want to screw around, they want to fuck, and they all fuck a scrubber, you know, no. No question. But deep down, they really are looking. They say to me, I'm looking for a girlfriend. I'm looking for the one. I think that every, you know, there's, it's easy to tar men with one brush, right? To say the way that men act between the age of 17 and 25 is just, you can extrapolate that for the rest of time. And it's like, well, obviously not. But evidently that's not the case. The libido goes down and stuff, you know. I think the libido is a big part of it. I mean, a 39-year-old man, has not got the libido of an 18 year old. He just does not. So that means, okay, he likes sex, but it's not that everything is about getting a quick shag. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's not that anymore. It's about something else. It's about, yes, good sex, but with in a loving relationship. And that changes the requirements or what a man is looking for. So yeah, I think using it that model. The tits, I would say. Using that model, uh, like that, whatever you have, experienced as a girl as a young dating uh, in the the dating world between the ages of whatever 18 25 and maybe 18 30 or something like that and then extrapolating that forward just running that same script and thinking that this is the way that it's going to be for the rest of time like you have to appreciate that that's not going to be the case but the main thing that i want girls and guys to take away from this is that it's fucking terrifying for most guys to go up and talk to a girl. Yeah. Like it really, really is a big deal. I know that that's so lame and it's like such a wet thing to say. That like, oh my God, you went up and spoke to a girl. Like, but we've just identified there's bomb disposal experts, firemen and policemen out there who are scared of saying, hi, my name's John. Um, can I buy you a drink? Like, you know, the fact that you've got that says absolutely everything. And hopefully today we're going to have taught guys look here are some ways that you can over overcome approach anxiety you need to have uh, expand that domain of competence do progressive overload make yourself become less sensitive to it you need to escalate you need to have things to say and girls on the flip side of that it's like be receptive to it you know if a guy comes up to unless you're in a relationship or whatever and even that can be done with a bit of class and grace right like you you don't need to give the guy who you're not going to be in a relationship with anyway the like the that show i can't do the shoulder thing you know the shoulder thing i mean yeah yeah i can't do it girls every girl is innately born with the do the dirty look over the shoulder skill um but guy, yeah guys guys don't have it but like don't give them that like that guy might have plucked up a fucking ton of courage to come and speak to you and the fact that you're in a relationship right now should mean that you should hope like help that person to get to a relationship as opposed to 
this thing that people in fucking relationships do and guys do it as well, but girls do it a lot where because they're in a relationship, they use it as a yardstick to beat single guys with. It's almost like a guy can come up and they don't need to engage and they can almost be really, really vicious with the way that they respond because they're like, well, I've got a boyfriend. And it's like, yeah, you fucking wouldn't have acted this way six months ago. Six yeah. months ago, if that guy had come up to you, you wouldn't smug have had this. Smug fuckers, aren't they? Smug fuckers. Yeah, <laughs> so smug. So just be more fucking gracious, man. And this doesn't mean what's one of the main things that we've said today. You need to have this polarity. You need to have this masculine and feminine energy going on. You need to not just be the one thing across the board, this homogenous playing. I love that thing. What was it? Uh, not playing to win. What is that? Don't play it. Okay, so most people are playing not to lose. You need to play to win. It's game theory. It's gambling. I love that. So I think that, and that, you know, a lot of people, they're so terrified. And again, like if a guy's done that, it's probably because he's plucked up a fucking ton of courage to come over and speak yeah. to you with your group of girlfriends, all wearing pretty little thing dresses with like, you know, you red bottoms on, like be gracious about it. Yeah. You don't know the backstory. Absolutely. Uh, you just don't, he could be a dick, sure. But he also could be someone suffering from really bad anxiety and you're the first person he's ever spoken to, you know, in his whole life. You don't know the backstory. I, I, I've, ne- I've never, I've just never been horrible to a guy that's approached me. I mean, I've been kind of like, you know, I've got to go. Thank you. But I've never been, I've never done that look. I, I've never done it. It's really, it's funny. Even some of my friends just, I don't hang around those kind of people much. I'm not, I, I would say to you, mm. I think even maybe. if I'm thinking this, this person's not for me, I just know it's not. I'm always kind of like, uh, you know, thank you, but no thank you. But Maybe if there's, in, nice a, in a situation, how do you think, what can guys do to help other guys date and what can girls do to help other girls date? Is there anything that you think that they can, they can do? Like how can you gas your friends up so that they go over and speak to someone? Cause it's not often like, have you ever, here's a good one for you. The number of girls that have come over to me and said, Hey, uh, my friend over there thinks that you're really whatever, whatever this is. And it's like, all right, fucking hell. Like that's, that, that is such a, cause what do you do? Cause the girls still sat with all of her friends. Do you go over and just like appear within the group of friends that have all been talking about you? I would just say, well, tell her to come over here. I would have just said that. Great point. Show yeah. value. Kind of cover, you've got to show value. If you go there, Needy, you're going to Lion's Den. It's on her turf. It's like that's her her territory. If she, you know, just say to her, yeah, she's she's gorgeous. Give her that that bit of encouragement. Yeah, she's gorgeous, your friend. Tell her to come over. Just that. That's that. All I would say because you, you if you just say, oh, tell her to come over, um, the girl might be a bit nervous. Also, like, oh, what, what if? You know, what What if he doesn't like me? But if you've said, oh, she's gorgeous, okay, fine. She's going to have that confidence to come over to you. Because women, women can be a bit nervous too. Women are a bit all this also, trust me. That's why you're um, a professional. What can guys do? <laughs> Anything that guys can do to help their mates? Oh, um, not really. It, it's awful for a guy to come over and say, my friend likes you. It's not even cute. It's yeah, okay. No, if it's he's young, lame, again, if he's 18, it's fine. But um, the best thing to do is... Um, one of the best things that we did, we did this experiment where we went out with one of our students and I put him with one of my wing guys. I said, just trust me. In this. Um, I said, just trust me in what I'm going to tell him to say about you. So there were some girls at the table. And when he went, he could feel that there was no interest being built when, when, he, when the student went. He said, I got this, don't worry. He said, listen, my, my friend, he's like, he's such a player. It's like, it's best that you're kind of avoiding him. He's just a total player. Um, but anyway, and then when he got back, the girl was really interested in him because she'd already heard this. It was like, he's like, you said that. And he's like, yeah, it's working. Don't worry about it. But the other thing, guys, please, and to girls, if you have a male friend, please, please, if you have a male friend and you want to set him up with someone, never, ever introduce him as he's a really nice guy. Just don't do that. <laughs> so you know what? He's, he's a good guy. Uh, be careful of him. Be careful. You could do that sort of wink and you, you'll find that the girl's much more interested. They know oh, he's a nice guy. That means, oh, God, they've set him up with everybody. He's been, he's been single for a while. Yeah. It's just yeah. big red flashing lights, right? Yeah, little things like that. Um, I see so many women, people, women and men do it, and they just, oh, he's a really nice guy. I'm like, just stop. Yeah, if there was ever a way to stop, completely you know? ruin your friend's dating chances. But again, like that comes 
from firstly a place of good intentions, but secondly, a complete misunderstanding of how dating <laughs> dynamics work. So exactly. today, today you've taught people some things that are hopefully going to stop them from being quite so shit, both guys and girls. If uh, people want to find out more, guys want to take it to the next level, where should they go? Okay, go to my website, kezia-noble.com. Um, I'm also on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Um, yeah, subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's where most information is coming from. 75 million views in counting. Ooh, wow. But that means there's demand out there. 75 million views. There's 75 demand. 75 million guys thinking. No, 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 no for views. For fuck's <laughs> sake. Well, it's, maybe it's just one guy watching it 75 million oh, times. I, that's what I think it is. Just this one very, it's very just me. single It's just me watching my own videos. Constantly. Again, again, that's who those numbers are. exactly the same thing that I do. Look, everything that we've spoken about will be linked in the show notes below, including Kezia's uh, website. What have you got? Have you got a seven-day challenge? What stuff yeah. have you got if you want to do them? <laughs> uh, I have the, um, if you don't want to, um, you know, come over to London, and we've got the home training, acceleration home training program. Um, and if you do want to get your hands dirty, <laughs> uh, it's, you, you want to check out the seven day mastery program, which we had to stop during to the lockdown, but now we've reopened and, um, we're already really busy. Um, actually it's such a good time to meet women. I've noticed it. Like everyone's talking to each other cause they're like, I'm free. I'm out. Finally, I've got some fucking social and contact again. These are real, like we, these, these programs that I'm running, we don't just create like kind of like subtle mental shifts. I mean, these are mental breakthroughs. These are huge. Um, we've got so many video testimonials. That's why I always say to people, look, you know, it's not me just saying that. I've got hundreds of video testimonials. Go to my website, look at the video testimonials. Then guys from every uh, walk of life, being really honest, putting their faces out there and saying this has completely changed my life. So um, I hope to do the same for you. <laughs> fine not that's you a, but anyone isn't hey no I'm, 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 I'm single i'm single as fuck as well so i need all the help that you can get look thank you so much for coming on it's been awesome i've really really enjoyed it hopefully everyone's taken something away i want to know what you think like is the dating world fucked at the moment is it completely terrible and do we need kezia's help desperately also if anyone's got any suggestions for who i can get on as a dating <clears> coach for women like leave it below i'll try and get in touch with them and i'll try and get them on as well and then we can we can learn the equivalent red pills for girls that we've just learned for guys yeah, oh, yeah. Oh.